Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Shall we start? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So today's topic is uh, kidney and ureter. So initially, we'll be discussing the anatomy, uh, uh, relevant surgical anatomy of kidney and ureter, and then we'll talk about the renal stones today. Okay, which happens to be one of the most common clinically encountered condition. Okay, so first uh, about the kidney. So we know that humans, we have a pair of kidneys. Okay, and a kidney is having an outer cortex and an inner medulla. Okay, so the outer part is the cortex, the inner part is the medulla. So the medulla, there are a number of structures like this, pyramidal structures, which are called as the renal pyramids. So we have around 10 to 12 renal pyramids. Okay. So yes, the renal pyramid is placed like this. Okay. So the base, the wider base is at the cortex and the tip is at the medulla. So the tip is called as the papilla. Okay. It's called as the papilla. Here, the collecting ducts, they all join at this point, which is called as your papilla. Now, this papilla will open into what is called as a minor calyx. Okay, it opens into what is called as a minor calyx. Okay, so two to three minor calyx will join like this to form a major calyx. This is called as your major calyx. So each kidney has two to three major calyx. Okay, that. In the end, the major cortex will all join to form the renal pelvis and then continue as the ureter. Is that clear? Yes, ma'am. This is the renal pelvis. And this is the ureter. Right. So the urine, as uh, the blood gets filtered, the urine is formed. It flows through the papilla into the minor calyx, major calyx, renal pelvis, and ureter, and further on to the blood. Okay. So this is the initial uh, anatomy part of the kidney. Okay. So we all know this much. And what is to be remembered is that uh, each kidney, okay, here like this, is supplied by the renal artery. And the vein. Okay, so we know that we have a pair of renal artery as well as the vein. Now, the renal arteries, okay, will uh, form what are called the segmental arteries. Let's talk about the branches. First, we have the renal artery. So the renal artery is going to divide into the segmental arteries. There are five segmental arteries. You must be remembering this from your anatomy. We have five segmental arteries. Okay, so out of five, one is posterior and the rest four are anterior. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. So we have five segmental arteries, that is each kidney we have larger divided into one posterior and five anterior branches. Okay, sorry, four anterior and one posterior branch. So this four anterior branches, what are the names? One is called as the apical. Then we have the upper, middle, and lower. It just corresponds to the part of the kidney that they supply. That's it. Okay. And these arteries are called as the end arteries. Have you heard of the term end arteries? Yes, ma'am. Okay. End arteries meaning these arteries will supply the uh, corresponding parenchyma mm -hmm. and end there. There are no collaterals. As a result, if there is blockade in these arteries, it will result in the ischemia and the infarction of the corresponding renal parenchyma. That is, that part of the kidney will end up going for necrosis. Okay, that will be the dead part of the kidney. There are no collateral development. So important is they are all end arteries. Okay. Now, let's move on to the very most important concept that uh, that is the relations of the kidney. Okay. Kidney is related to a number of structures anteriorly and posteriorly. Okay, now we need to see the structures that it is and it is related anteriorly and posteriorly, both the kidneys. Because when you're doing surgery, when you open up, 
Okay, you won't be seeing kidneys separately. Well, there, there are so many structures you're going to see. You need to move them, you need to retract them, some you need to cut, some you need to be very careful on. That's why for a surgeon, relations are extremely important. Okay, so can we can we continue? Are you guys with me? Yes, ma'am. Now this is the right kidney. Okay, we'll talk with the left kidney in a while. Okay, now kidneys are retroperitoneal structures. Agreed? Yes. They're not covered by the peritoneum. Yes. Fine. Now here about the kidney. Here you know your renal gland. Correct. This is the right side. I'm writing here the right side. Fine. And here you have the C loop of the duodenum. That's the second part of the duodenum. Fine. And here you have the colon. Okay, this is your colon. That is nothing but your hepatic flexure. Correct? This is your hepatic flexure. Okay. Hepatic flexure. And you're going to see all this. Okay, see, whatever I drew now will be seen only after you elevate the liver. Let's say you cut the abdomen. Okay, you remember your dissection from anatomy. You have put a midline incision. You have opened this abdomen. And you the liver on top. Correct? So you grab yes. the liver and underneath you are going to see all this. Is my point clear? So yes. now you need to tell me what is this area covered by what is present above this area? What is present above this area? If we have to retract the liver to see the underlying structures, so this structure is covered by the liver, no? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. So these form the anterior relations of the kidney. Okay. Shall we name them? One, the right, right adrenal gland. Two, is the second part of the duodenum. Okay. Three, is the hepatic flexure. Four, is the liver. Is that understood? Yes, ma'am. Should I go slow or is this fine? Fine. Okay. Now we'll go on to the left kidney. Okay. Now with the left kidney, something similar to this will happen. Here you have the left adrenal gland. Okay. Then here you have the spleen. So we know spleen is on the left side. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Here you have the spleen. And this here is your pancreas. Okay, this part is your pancreas. So you should know that there is C loop of duodenum, which is here. Okay, basically, this whole picture should be here, more close. Okay, I've given a separate picture so that you understand it more clearly. Okay, this is your pancreas. And here you have your colon again. This will be your Splenic flexure. Is this clear? Yes. But your transverse colon, this will be your descending colon. This is your splenic flexure. And this area over here will be covered by your what? Stomach. This is on the left side, no? Yeah. So there is stomach on the side. So these form the anterior relation to the left kidney. Can we name them from the beginning? One. Yes, ma'am. One I don't know. Very good. Two. Spleen. Spleen. Very good. Okay. Then three. Is pancreas. The tail of pancreas or the body of the pancreas? Uh, body of the pancreas. Tail. Body. Very good. Very good. Body. Not the tail because the tail will go into the hilum of the spleen. Yes, ma'am. So the right answer will be the body of the pancreas. Then coming to the fourth one, which is this blue part here is the fifth one. Stomach. Stomach. So these form the anterior relation of the right as well as the left kidney. Now, are both the kidneys at the same level anatomically? No. No, ma'am. All right. 
So the right kidney is at higher level or lower level? Lower level. Lower level. Why so? It's because right kidney is at lower level. Liver. 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 Let the further upward migration of the right kidney. Okay, because the liver is the will occupy the area. So right kidney is at a lower level. Fine. Right? Now you can say the hilum of the of both the kidneys. Okay, will uh, almost lie at the level of L two. Right, that corresponds to what is called as the transpyloric. So when you're doing the surface anatomy, okay, when you put this uh, gauge on the abdomen, there is a line which is called as the transpyloric line passing at the level of L two. That will correspond to the location of the hilum of the kidney. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So let me fine. So now this forms the anterior relation. So I said that okay. If we go back to this, if you see here, there is liver now and there is kidney. So there is a, a, a location which is called as the Morrison's pouch. Have you heard of Morrison's pouch? Yes, ma'am. What is this Morrison's pouch? It is nothing but the hepatorenal pouch. Yes, ma'am. The hepatorenal pouch or the space. Now see, the liver is covered by the peritoneum. So the posterior part of the liver, which is having the peritoneum, and the anterior part of the kidney, there is a space. Correct. That pouch, that space is called as the hepatorenal pouch. Are you getting it? Yes, ma'am. So the anterior relation is liver now in front of the kidney. So the space between that liver and the kidney, there is some space now behind it. So that yes. Is The Morrison's pouch, and this happens to be the most uh, dependent part when the patient is lying, when the person is lying down. Correct. So, if you've done any abdominal surgeries or anything, if there is any collection in the peritoneal cavity, it is more likely to be in this space when the patient is lying supine. You get it. So, this will be the most dependent part. Okay. In supine position. Why is this important? If you've done any surgery, it becomes important and mandatory to put a drain in this position. You keep a collection. Drain. Sorry. Is there any collection in? Uh, exactly. So if, after surgery, if you have any collection, if you leave it there, what will happen? It will get infected, and there will be peritonitis. So you have to drain yeah. it if there is any collection. So you put a drain in this. Place and you leave it for few days following the surgery. Okay, that's one thing I had to tell there. And uh, okay, mm. here. So now we talk about the posterior relation, uh, anterior relation. We'll talk about the posterior relations now. So posteriorly, again, we have our right kidney here. Okay, this will be our left, and this will be our right because we're seeing it from the back. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay, right and left. Okay, first we have a rib. So right is at a lower level, as I told. So eleventh, sorry, seven. Uh, on the left side, you will have the eleventh rib and the twelfth rib both. On the right side, you will have only the twelfth rib. Clear? Twelfth rib, your eleventh and the twelfth rib, because this is at is at a higher level compared to the right side. Okay, then we have muscle over here. Okay, here you have the most medial part is your psoas major. The kidney will lie on your psoas major muscle, and this is your psoas major, the one in the red. Now let's mark two to three nerves here. We have the subcostal nerve, the iliohypogastric nerve, and the ilioinguinal nerve on both the sides. The posterior relations are very simple. We have two ribs on the left side. Right side we have a single rib. Three nerves. So, Should I write it down? The so first one is the subcostal nerve. Next, we have the hypogastric nerve. And then we have the inguinal nerve. Okay, you must remember this and tell the importance of this when we talk about the ureteric stones. Okay, ureteric calculi. Okay, we are talking about the referred pain over there. I'll tell about these nerves. Then this, what is this muscle? Swas. 
Soas meja. Meja. Soas meja. Fine. So these form the most important posterior relations. Now we have finished the kidney for once. We will go on to the ureter. So ureter, what is the length of the ureter? 25 centimeters. Very good. 25 centimeters, out of which 12.5 is abdominal. And the neck rest 12.5 centimeters is pelvic. Okay. When can you say it is abdominal pelvic? When it crosses what is called as the pelvic brim. Yes, sir. Okay, when it crosses the pelvic brim, it becomes pelvic. Now, what will be the diameter of the ureter? It is as thin or as small as 4 mm. Okay, that's why you see any obstruction. Small calculi will also cause obstruction and pain. Because the inner diameter is only 4 mm. Okay. And at the same side, if you have to put a scope through the ureter, what should be the size of your scope? Less than 4 mm. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay, somewhere around 3 mm, that will be the size of your scope. That's tiny the scope will be. And the tinier it gets, it becomes very, what do you call, pointed. Yes, sir. So the most common complication that it will result in will be perforation. You have to be very gentle when you're going to put this scope into the ureter. It's called a ureteroscope. When you want to pa pass it, you have to be very careful. Otherwise, if you just thrust it like that, it will cause perforation. Perforation. Okay, fine. So, now uh, we will talk about the relations of the ureter. Nothing much. There are very two, two to three very simple relations that you need to know. And the constructions of the ureter. Okay. So, uh, this is your right kidney. This is your left kidney. You have the pelvis. And then where you have the ureter going down. Okay, whatever I say on the right side will be the same, similar thing on the left side, not all, all, not the same exactly. Okay, so I told you this is the ure the renal pelvis, correct? And this is your ureter. So this junction is called as the pelvic junction. It is the first anatomical constriction that is present in the ureter. Next, it is going to pass through what is this? This is your pelvic brain. Let's say this is your pelvic brim. Okay. So this will be your second constriction when you're going to pass on the pelvic brim. So when it is going down, okay, what happens is you here you have your artery. Which artery is coming here? See, this is your abdominal aorta. Correct? Your renal yes. artery is coming, big arteries over here. Then as it comes down here, it is going to divide into what are these? The common iliac vessels. Yes. Correct. The common iliac will then give the internal iliac and the external iliac. The internal and the external. So, the second constriction is when the kidney, the ureter is lying over the common iliac vessel. When it is going to enter the pelvic brim. Correct. So, see, I have written the, uh, the ureters first. Actually, first there is an artery and the ureter will be above it. Okay. That is your second constriction. Right, and next in males, what happens? It is crossed anteriorly by the vas deferens. What is vas deferens? This permetic, uh, the continuous. Yes, so this will be your third constriction. Okay, when the ureter is crossed anteriorly by the vas deferens. So logically, this will be seen only in the male. Male. Okay. So next what happens is that it is going to enter the bladder. This is our bladder. So here you have the intramural part of the ureter. Correct? It is going to enter. This is called a vesico ureteric junction. Vesico ureteric junction. So which is the narrowest part now? The vesico ureteric junction is the narrowest part. Narrowest part of the ureter. Okay. Is that clear? 
and when the ureter is coming down what happens is that anteriorly it is crossed by a gonadal vessel so this is your gonadal vessel passing like this so what are these the right and the left gonadal vessels they are going to cross from medial to lateral anteriorly is this relation clear yes sir okay that's about the ureter and what kind of epithelium what is the lining of the ureter it is lined Trans by transition epithelium or transitional epithelium which is the same as that of the bladder very good so the lining epithelium is the same next will if you have to see about the um blood supply okay blood supply of the ureter is pretty important the ureters are supplied by the following arteries in the again we'll draw one kidney in the ureter okay the upper one third is supplied by your renal artery only okay the upper one third then we are talking about the middle one third where you have what i told you one artery crosses it anteriorly from medial to lateral what is that gonad yes so the middle one third is supplied by your gonadal artery branches from the abdomen artery gonadal artery then the lower part the lower one third here you have what is called as the uh, uh, superior vesicular mm -hmm. artery superior vesicular artery is nothing but the artery which is supplying your vesicle which is nothing but your bladder okay superior vesicular artery and it is supplied by a number of tiny branches from so many other arteries okay like for example inferior vesicular artery the uterine artery in females vaginal artery middle colic arteries uh, mid middle rectal artery so these are all the branches of what is called the internal iliac vessel i told you the common iliac is going to give internal iliac and the external iliac so whatever yes, branches i mentioned a number of branches which i just mentioned are all branches of the internal iliac now if you given an mcq that the ureter is supplied by the following except okay your answer should be external iliac artery because none of the branches of the external iliac are going to supply the ureter okay yes sir so now we will go on to the renal calcula so this is the important parts that i have to mention now regarding the renal or nothing but the renal stones so this is very very common okay yes sir in one or two people or like whom you know might be suffering from renal stones so there is a term that i want to mention here that is the uh, randall's plaques have you heard about this term yes ma'am soft tissue calcium sir yeah. so these are nothing but your soft, soft tissue tissue calcium yeah. where is this present renal medulla yes this is present in the medulla now this is going to act as a nucleus because there is already some amount of calcification it's going to act as a nucleus around mm -hmm. which further deposition of the infection mm -hmm. stones and bacteria will lead to stone formation so this is one of the pre uh, disposing factors the development of stones renal stones okay now if the renal stone should mm -hmm. occur there are two important processes that should happen one is called as the super saturation saturation sorry super saturation the next one is crystallization so when can super saturation occur when you have a lot of solutes increased solutes or decreased water content in the urine correct so the causes for increased solutes could be many which we will enumerate in a while and decreased water intake okay dehydration could be the cause for super saturation once there is super saturation it will lead to crystallization of the solutes and there will be formation of stones okay now we will talk about the different types of stones so the most common 
we'll talk about the types of stones. Right. So the most one will be your calcium stones. Right? <coughs> your calcium oxalates. Oxalates are the most common stones. Okay, calcium stones. Now, what could be the causes for uh, calcium uh, stones? One is you're having increased I calcium in the urine. Okay. It could be because of a number of reasons. Let's talk about it. One is called mm -hmm. the adsorptive hypercalciuria. This is right down the term. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll ex explain what this is. Then you have reabsorptive hypercalciuria. Then another term, which is the renal hypercalciuria. So in all these conditions we have higher calcium, that is increased calcium in from stone. Now, what do you mean by hypercalciuria? Meaning your gut, for some unknown reason, are absorbing more calcium from the gut. Calcium absorption is more. You have taken more vitamin D, you have taken more calcium in your diet. So there is increased calcium from the gut coming from the gut. Next is the reabsorption. From where are you reabsorbing? putting into the blood and hence coming in the urine it is from the bone. What is the condition where you will remove more calcium from the bone? What is the condition? You are producing a reabsorption of calcium from the bone. So bones are becoming weaker and weaker. Reabsorption? Yes. So what is that condition? It's a endocrinal what? condition. Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is age related. What is the endocrine condition? Which hormone is associated with calcium metabolism? Parathyroidism. Parathormone. Exactly. So increased parathormone. So increased parathormone is going to cause more of resorption of the bone. So increased calcium in the blood. So again, increased calcium in the urine, causing reabsorptive hypercalciuria. Next is renal hypercalciuria. Here the kidney is not absorbing. Okay. Not absorbing the calcium. So it is just getting excreted in the urine. Correct. These are the causes. Now for oxalates, there is a condition called hyperoxaluria as well. Hyperoxaluria. So one, it could be because you took more oxalates in your diet. Uh, best uh, source of oxalates would be something you take in the morning. Tomato. Sorry, green vegetables they all have, but then see, phytates and oxalates are more in tea, tannins and all. So tea is a rich source of oxalates. Okay, so then coming to another bowel condition, okay, wherein you have uh, let's say small bowel. Uh, condition. We have uh, resected some amount of the bowel and now it, it's gone for malabsorption. Okay. Here what happens is that the uh, lining uh, epithelium will be there, na, of the gut will become more permeable for oxalates. It happens in malabsorptive syndromes like that of let's say prawns. Okay. Like prawn disease. So here the permeability of the intestine is more for oxalates. So these are the conditions of hyperoxaluria. Fine. So we are going to uh, have calcium oxalate stones. Now calcium stones are what do you call uh, they are they radio opaque or radio lucent? Opaque. Radio opaque. opaque. Very good. So we are going to study a number of other stones. Uh, while we study that, I'll tell you whether they are radio opaque or radio lucent. Okay. Now we'll go on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. um, or I just mentioned here about the monophasic. Okay, there, we have two types in this. Okay, calcium oxalate stones could be monohydrate or dihydrate. Monohydrate and dihydrate. So, 
the monohydrate stone mm-hmm. if you see under the microscope okay you you got a crystal and you put it under a microscope how does this look this looks like a dumbbell shaped okay so the monohydrate stones are dumbbell shaped so dihydrate stones look like envelopes so these are called as the envelope shaped or the bipyramidal shaped crystals should i write that down monohydrate are dumbbell shaped okay so dihydrate are nothing but envelope shaped or bipyramidal shaped they will inevitably ask these um, shapes in your entrance exam so they give a number of options for this so you will have to remember the appearance okay now let, next let's move on to uric acid stones okay uric acid so uric acid stone again logically there is increased production of uric acid what could be the reasons what are the two main conditions where you see increased uric acid in the blood gout very good gout and one metabolic uh, disorder your metabolic disorder where you will have self destructive habits with mental retardation it's a condition that you have studied in your biochemistry in first year it's a syndrome with lesland syndrome yes with self mutilating features that is called lesnihan syndrome very good okay then you could also have it in case of milo proliferative yes what happens in milo proliferative disorders you are producing Lot. Yes, it's nothing but your leukemia. Yes, you are producing a lot of cells. In the end, all of them will die, na? So there will be once there is destruction, you will have lots of purine and pyrimidines coming in. So uric acid is basically because of increased purine metabolism. Okay. So if you see the ultimate pathway of the purine metabolism will be from hypoxanthine. will be something called as xanthine yes sir it will ultimately be yeah, uric acid correct yes so you just mm-hmm. mentioned the drug what is that drug name allopurinol allopurinol what does allopurinol do mm-hmm. it blocks it blocks the pathway hypoxanthine right. so you will not have any uric acid so you don't have uric acid you will not have the stone formation so um, uric acid stones will not be formed now apart from this okay you can give allopurinol what will be the other ways of managing this the condition first is i said it is because of super saturation which can occur because of increased uric acid and decreased water so what will you advise them drink plenty of water exactly so the first advice that you would give to any renal stone patient okay and uric acid as it is in the name it is an acid so see if you give them a base what will happen it acid plus base is going to form a salt 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 is going to be water soluble yes sir another logic in the management of renal stone would be if it is a basic stone give an acid if it is an acidic stone give a base basically form salt and precipitate that that means it will form salt which is soluble in water and goes away so now if it is an acid what should you give you should give a base you should alkalinize the urine the agent that we use is acetazole amide so acetazole amide is an alkaline agent that's going to form salt okay yes then one more thing is diet you just ask them to take less purine in their diet that means avoid uh, animal products meat and the basically the red meat all these yes. will be avoided that would be the management part then is uric acid radio opaque or radio lucent radio lucent 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 now there is a mnemonic that i want to give here it is called the it university of xanthin somehow i just try to, like to remember it like this it university of xanthin so u is for uric acid uric acid xanthin as you can see here already it is also radio lucent you can get to know from here and it 
T stands T stands for triumphering, and I stands for Indian Aviator. Does these things strike any chord in your brain? Do you remember what these 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 uh, things are? What are these? Have you heard mm -hmm. of the names? Indian Aviator. That is the anti-HIV drugs. Yes, antiviral. Uh, antiviral. Protease inhibitor. It's one of the protease inhibitor. Okay. Then triamterine. Potassium sparing diuretics. Yes, this is a potassium sparing diuretic that we use. So, all use of these drugs will can cause stones, and these stones will happen to be radio. Lucent. This is the new And I told you one more logic now. Uh, the um, acidification and alkalinization. The, the yes. demand for that is CCU. These are all drugs which are acidic in nature. You for again, you know, uric, uric, acid. uric acid. C is basically a calcium stone. And another C will be a cysteine. We we'll study cysteine. cysteine. Okay, so these are all acidic components. Okay, now in uric acid, as I told you, this radio leucine. How does this form appear? It's going to have, it's like a rosette shape. Okay. Yeah, rosette shape. So it's going to have multifaceted structure. As in, it's just so irregular. It's like you take some structure and you have multiple surfaces on it. You just cut it like that. So it will be rosette shaped and multifaceted. There's no one strict structure for it. Okay, that's about you. Uric acid stones. Now let's uh, next move on to another important category. Is nothing but your struvite stones. Struvite, also called stagon. Stagon or metal phosphate. Stagon. Okay. So what are the triple phosphate? What are the three components here? Calcium. Uh, Magnesium. Yeah. Phosphate. And ammonium. Very important. And H4 yes, and phosphate. So, triple stands for calcium, magnesium, and ammonium. Now, see, this is common in males or females? Females. Female. Yes. So, see, renal stones are more common in males in general. But, two white stones are more common in females. Okay, see, these stones are infective in etiology. Okay, yes. they're because yes. of infections. Now, UTIs are more common in males or females? Females. females. Reason is? Short urethra. Short urethra. Urethra is just around 4 centimeters. Four centimeters. Okay, more common, uh, more commonly they'll have infections. Now, if then there is an infective nidus, they result in common. You know, so now, infection is with an organism called as the proteus. Proteins. Okay. Now, this proteus will produce an enzyme. What is the name of the enzyme? It is yeah. urease. So, proteus is the organism which is going to produce an enzyme called as urease. So what this urease does is, it is going to break down your uric acid into Urea. ammonia. Ammonia. Okay. Now, this ammonia is an H3. So, it will be added. It will get one H added with it and becomes an ammonium ion. And this ammonium is nothing but this ammonium that you are saying. Triple phosphate. Okay. So, next time you don't need to remember some of this. Ammonium is there. You know, triple ka component is ammonium. How is ammonium coming? It's from proteus. Because of the presence yes. of the enzyme, ureus. Fine. Right? Yes. Now, these stones are usually very large. Okay. Mm. So unlike mm. the others, these are very large. Now, they are going to occupy the whole of your calicial system. Okay. So, the whole stone will be occupying this space. So, so it is going to look like a horn of a stag. So, that's why it's called as stag horn calculus. That's why it's Okay. Yes, sir. Now, 
these stones they are going to uh, let's say occlude the whole of your brain system okay so hence it will cause bacteria onto the kidney so it will cause silently it will cause damage to the kidney okay it's called it causes silent damage to the kidney so these are two big you cannot you one uh, modality for removal of the stones you will have to use multiple modalities okay yes, okay you just write it down it's called pcnl with esm mm -hmm. okay we'll see what are these procedures in a while okay now let's say a patient is repeatedly having stool white stones repeatedly that means bar bar she is having infection with protein now in that case you can give her drug which can inhibit the ureas the drug is कंडीशन Cystine urea, again a metabolic condition. Where we have excretion of uh, cystine in the urine, and these stones happen to be the hardest stones. They're very hard. You cannot break them. Okay. So what do you do here? The hardest. They are the hardest because of the presence of the disulfide bond. Okay. So cystine is having sulfur containing amino acid na so it has sulfur in it so this will form disulfide bonds and they have they assume what is called as the benzene for the uh, hexagonal structure so this structure is very difficult to break so that they form the strongest bonds correct yes ma'am fine so next little word about the xanthine stones we already know this is the specialty of xanthine stone under the mnemonic University of Delhi, so that is one of the radiolucent, radiolucent stones. And again, it is uh, can be inhibited by the drug allo. Very low. Correct. Fine. Now on microscopy, you see them as brick red uh, crystals. Okay, the brick red. So one of the features of xanthine stone. the patient has been calculated like, how will they present you the first thing they're going to have is pain yes ma'am talking about the Thank clinic you. yes you are in the emergency you are in the casualty room and most commonly these are the patients who come in the early morning around 4 to 6 so those most of those patients who come during that time will be having in a calculate so they come with pain abdomen and this happens to be more in the month of ramzan you will know why because they will be fasting they will not take water throughout the day and dehydration lack of water is another predisposing factor for stone formation this is one of the yes. seasonal variation we see in the disease okay. so pain abdomen they'll have pain in the flank region so usually they will say it is radiating to the it's classically described as Loin to ground. Loin to ground. Yes. Correct. This is your clinical yes. term that is loin to. Now, as I have mentioned, the nerve supply of the ureter, I mean the kidney, the relation of the nerve to the kidney. We'll talk about the radiation. If the stone happens to be in the upper third of the ureter, the middle third of the ureter, and the lower third of the ureter. First of all, they'll have pain in the flank region. Correct. Corresponding to the kidney. now what happens is pain here it will radiate to the uh, let's say the testis in male and the labia majora in female okay you could remember it because there is the gonadal nerve also passing over there okay it could be because of that it's in, if it is in the upper third if it's in the middle third 
it will be radiated to the hypogastrium okay and your um, in, uh, what is this iliac fossa if it's on the right side it will be radiated to the right iliac fossa on the left side it will be to the left iliac fossa so what do you think is the nerve involved here ilio hypogastric that's it ilio hypogastric simple now this is very important because these are the conditions that are missing with the other acute abdominal conditions if it's in the right side if it's radiating to the right iliac fossa then you will think of most common differential will be your right renal stroke ah uh, appendicitis appendicitis very important so in, when you are in the casualty you need to make a decision whether this is appendicitis or renal cavity appendicitis you will have to open up into an appendicectomy for renal cavity yeah. all you have to do is send him on with drugs that's all correct so yes. we will take up appendicitis in another in a further later class so today we are just seeing the differential diagnosis okay if it on the left side it will be a diverticulitis diverticulitis are common on the left side so differential that will keep in mind will be diverticulitis now if you are talking about the lower one side the pain will radiate to the uh, your uh, inguinal region and the inner aspect of thigh inner aspect of thigh so the nerve involved here will be iliounguinal inguinal so now next time the patient comes to the emergency you will approximately get to know the location of the calculi depending upon the radiation of the pain fine yes sir okay so now they have come to the emergency you have to order some investigations for them what will you do so came with complaints of uh, pain abdomen okay what could be the reason for this pain abdomen See, this is the kidney, and this is your ureter. So there's a stone here. There obstruction. Be, obstruction. Ureteri collapse. Because of this obstruction, what will happen? That there are smooth muscles in the wall of the ureter. So they will try to push it. There will be forceful contraction that will be coming over here. It is going to cause colicky type of pain. That could be the cause, or because of the stone. There's already enough back pressure over here. The kidney is enlarged. Okay, and the renal capsule is stretched. There is stretching of the capsule. There are two reasons for pain abdomen. One is the colic. Two is the stretching of the capsule. Is that clear? Now, next, we have to order the investigation. We are going to order the urine tests first. Mm -hmm. We are going to say, get one urine routine and get the microscopy done. So, in this, you are going to know what is the specific gravity, what is the pH of the urine, and all those things sugar content, albumin, and so on. So, then what are we interested in is they will also tell you the presence of RBCs or WBCs or pus cells. Is there any any presence of pus cells? Then you know it is UTI infection. Yes, so you will have to treat UTI. Just out of interest, I am asking UTI. What will be the drug of choice for UTI? Just someone ask your relative like having burning situation. You will have to suggest. The palasporin. Which one? The palasporin. Um, cephalosporin is not something that we use for uh, UTIs actually. Nitrosporin. We we usually give uh, ciplox. Okay, so these are this is nothing but they target your gram negative. See, the most common cause for UTI will be your either E. coli. Mister E. coli. Hmm. So these are the gram negative organisms. So you will have to give ciplox. Usually, tablet ciplox, five hundred mg. We say BD for five days. Okay, or there's another drug which is very good. It is tablet nitrofurantoin. Hello. You would have learned this in your pharmacology. Nitrofurantoin, hundred mg, BD. 
we also um, give one syrup have you heard of that syrup alka syrup yeah or sitar ka whatever we call it what does this actually do see it is um, citral ka usually it is going to alkalinize the urine okay so you have the citrate content so citrate and magnesium the ones which inhibit the formation of stone so they decrease the incidence of stone so we have heard so many conditions which precipitate the stone formation na this increased calcium increased uric uh, oxidate uric acid all these things but your calcium your magnesium and your citrate are going to inhibit the stone formation okay that's why that we give uh, citrate that then drug of drug of choice of uti is the ciprox ciprox oh. so we also give nitrofurantoin that's also very good drug because and the only uh, what what happens with nitrofurantoin is that the only mode of excretion of that drug is through the kidneys So its action will come in when the drug is being excreted. It does not undergo any kind of metabolism. Ma'am, yeah, in case of pregnancy, so we can't uh, give nitroflurane. You you could actually then we give ciprox only. Now ciprox is not nitroflurane. Nitroflurane has certain side effects, so hence yes. uh, we give ciprox. Okay. So drug of choice happens to be ciprox. then apart from the urine routine microscopy in microscopy they'll also give you the crystals if there are any crystals they'll tell you what is the structure of the crystal now we know if it's dumbbell shape what it is what it is dumbbell shape calcium oxalate monohydrate yes ma'am okay dihydrate will be envelope shape so you keep revising these things okay so based on the crystal ka shape also we can diagnose the kind of stone okay and we can also go for what called culture and sensitivity urine culture and sensitivity this will is to rule out any uh, presence of any infection so they will say which organ is this and what is it is uh, sensitivity okay all this uh, imaging uh, studies will do what is called as the x ray kud so what are the stones which are radio opaque everything else other than it u x u Correct. So they are all radio opaque. Right. So now for them, we will do X-ray QD, and they will show up. And ninety percent of the urine, uh, the ureteric uh, or the renal calculi are radio opaque. Right. Ninety percent are. Okay. And now, if you do X-ray, can you find out uh, the condition of the kidney if there is hydro uh, hydro necrosis? Can you make that out? That's not possible. Correct. You see, no. Show, no? We will not get to know the kidney status. So for that, you will have to do what is called an ultrasound. We will do ultrasound to find out the hydronephrosis component. And we have certain special scans that we uh, do for kidney. Okay, that I would like to mention here. That is IVP and RGP. Have you heard of IVP? Yes, sir. Okay. Intravenous. Pilogram. So what you do is i you put an iv line and you give the contrast uh, uh, intravenously and that contrast will be uh, what do you call excreted by the kidney it is going to concentrate in the kidney and as the uh, the contrast gets eliminated in the kidney you're going to take serial images one is at 0 seconds then you will take it at 1 minute then 5 minutes it's it's like that so take serial images if there is a block There is no flow of contrast. You know there is an obstruction. Correct. So here you are going to get to know the renal function also, whether the re renals are producing the urine or not. Correct. And you also get to know the proximal part of the obstruction. You get my point. This is yes, okay. Let's say there is a stone over here. Now from the IV system, okay, the kidney has filtered all of that, and then this is all glowing. This is all the contrast part. comes and here is stop there is stoppage the contrast will not go further down it is telling that the contrast is coming here that means the renal function is fine okay and it is telling that it is telling about the proximal part of the obstruction it is going to tell us where exactly the obstruction is that is the role of ivp and there another investigation which is called rgp which is nothing but your retrograde bilobe 
retrograde phylogram phylogram so here you do the same thing but in the opposite direction you are going to put the contrast into the bladder okay you are going to like kind of flush it okay and then it is going up in the ureter if there is a block it doesn't ascend up so it's a retrograde phylogram so you will study the part which is distal to the obstruction does that make sense yes sir okay then we will see there are two more additional special scans that have been mentioned you must have heard there is something called a dmsa scan the dtpa scan yes ma'am mag3 scan so i'm just mentioning here uh, because we are running out of time for this class this is part 1 we will continue it in the part 2 so i'll just mention what these are okay dmsa stands for di marcato succinic acid yes succinic acid scan fine dtpa stands for dithyl triamine pentaacetic acid triamine pentaacetic acid and mag3 will be mark marcato acetyl glycine acetyl glycine glycine so now these are the uh, forms that we have to know there's no other way out and what is important is why do we use dmsa the answer is in the mnemonic so it's s for we are going to study the structure renal yes. structure we are going to basically study about the structure of the this one now the kidney basically it's for the morphology and it is also to know the present of scars so that is what you want this is more like a anatomical scan if you have to call it anatomical scan now if you talk about dtpa this is more to do with the function p for perfusion it's 7 o'clock okay p for perfusion means how much of blood is coming and how much of urine is being produced so it is more of a physiology for a functional scan Yes, ma'am. So DMSA is more DTPA is more functional, and this MAC3 is also used to know about the perfusion. This is also similar to DTPA, but MAC3 is much better than DTPA. Is that fine? And uh, today we'll uh, end with the what you call uh, management. Okay, of the renal stone, there's a lot in the management. So I'll just tell about the conservative management. As in, what are the patients for whom you can just say water, give citral car, give antibiotic, and who are those patients? Okay, uh -huh. whom you can do this. So first is the stone size. Does it depend on the size? Obviously, bigger the stone, you have to go for more surgical procedures. Lesser the size of the stone, you can do, go for a conservative management. Okay, so first is size less than five mm. All you're going to tell them is reassure. Okay. Two is if it is present in the lower third of the. First is the size, and then is the location. Then, if there is no dilation of the ureter, the proximal part, no dilation of the ureter. As in, there are no obstructive features. It's fine. It will pass on. Okay. So, what will you tell them? Plenty of water. Yes, you're going to say a lot of water intake. Then, if it's acid, normally they happen to be calcium stones. Like any, most of them are calcium stones. So, you will have to alkalinize them. What will you give them? So, we are going to give them yeah. syrup. Yes, you're going to ask them to take this. That's all. And then you will be like, it will pass on. Usually they say you should take up to four to six liters of water per day. Okay. So then further on, there are so many procedures about E, W, L, P, C, N, L, and all those things which we will be discussing in the next class. Okay. So I'm just going to show you one of the slides.
Can you see it now? Can you see the screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So this is the uh, anatomy of the kidney, which we have just seen. The outer cortex. Then we have the medulla. We have the pyramids. Can you can you relate to whatever I drew? Yes, ma'am. Okay, the calyces. And one thing that I that is there in the picture and I did not mention is see the structure in the hilum from anterior to posterior. Which is the structure which is coming first? If you the, see, uh, the vein. See, the vein is present anterior to the renal artery. Yes, ma'am. Correct. So the structures of the hilum from anterior to posterior would be the vein, then the artery, and then comes the renal penis. Is that clear? Yeah, sir. Okay, so the the mnemonic will be V A U. Yeah. Vein, artery, and the ureter. Pelvis. Yes, the renal pelvis or the VAP or uh, V A U. So whichever mnemonic is is easier. Fine. Next, here this will is depicting the anterior relation to the kidney. I suggest you revise this again because this is volatile. But if you remember this anatomy, okay, you draw it your, for yourself and keep it. See, you can see on the right kidney, if you're dealing with the right kidney first, is the suprarenal area. Then I have told there is the duodenal area. It's the second part of the duodenum. C loop. Okay. Then you have the hepatic flexure and the hepatic area. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Coming to the left side, we have one extra relation to be learned. That's the suprarenal area. Then we have the splenic, the gastric, the pancreatic, and the colonic. You must be able to answer this by closing your eyes. Okay. And if you see here, the structure of the hilum, it is vein, artery, renal mm -hmm. pelvis, clearly mentioned. Okay. That relation mm -hmm. is very important. And if you see here, which vein is longer, the right or the left? Left. The left is longer. The left renal vein is around three times longer compared to the right. The right will be around four centimeters, three to four centimeters in length. But on the uh, left side, it's going to be up to eight to 10 centimeters. So what is the application of this? Any idea? When will you think of a longer vein? When you have to transplant the kidney. If you're taking kidney from a person, from a, let's say a cadaver, Okay, and you have to transplant it to a living person. Okay, you will usually prefer the left kidney because it's having a longer renal vein. So you get lot of this one for anastomosis. Even if some part of it goes wrong, you can just cut it and suture it again. Do you get the application of it? Yes, ma'am. Usually the left renal vein, uh, uh, kidney is chosen for transplantation. Next, this is a picture for the relations of the ureter. As you can see, it is coming down. It is lying on the psoas major. Okay, the big muscle bulbs at the posterior side are the psoas major. Then you can see the iota bifurcating into your common iliacs. Correct? And then your uh, I, uh, ureter is passing anterior to that. And then coming down to enter the bladder. Next. Yeah, renal calculi associated with proteus infection. What is it? Uric acid, triple phosphate, calcium oxalate, or xanthan? Uh, triple yeah. phosphate. Yes, nothing but your have on this two white stones. Yes, which are associated with your infection. It is with proteus and ureus formation of that. Okay, triad of renal colic. Swelling in the loin, which disappears after passing you. Have you heard of this thing? Yes, ma'am. You know? Dates. Little Dates. 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 What Dates triad is, there's a particular stone, let's say, which is obstructing the ureter, okay, causing renal colic. Because the, the ureter is trying to expel the stone, you're going to have the colicky pain. And there is stagnation of the urine. Okay, it's the it is uh, that's a swelling in the kidney, so that's why you're going to have a swelling in the loin region. And after some time, the patient is going to pass large volumes of urine, and the swelling will also disappear, and the pain will also disappear. That is nothing but your tittle triad. We'll see about the other triads as we go on to the 
further chapters. Chart codes is associated with your pain, fever, jaundice. Yes, seen in um, cholestis, uh, uh, CBD, cholangitis, acute cholangitis. Yes, it is nothing but acute cholangitis in CBD stones. Okay, then same stride again. We'll talk about it, diverticulosis and all that. Things. Okay, the right answer here is detail stride. Okay. <clears throat> for uretric colic, if we have to give one drug to manage the pain, what would that drug be? Nitrates, pethidine, PCT, mm -hmm. paracetamol, and ticophenic. So nitrates have no role here. Right? Diclofenac. Diclofenac is the drug of choice. Okay. <clears throat> Even if you have any other drugs, diclo is the drug of choice. Okay. okay. Pethidine is a type of a, what you call uh, words, but it's not indicated in this. Okay. The answer is diclo. Which of the following stones are hard to break by ESWL? See, I'll tell you about ESWL. It stands for extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. You're going to give shockwaves from the outside, okay, outside the body. These waves, what happens is they're going to pass through the soft tissue. And then once they encounter a hard substance like a stone, the energy will be transmitted to the stone. And then it's going to cause breaking of the stone, erosion and shattering of the stones. Okay, so that is called ESWL. That means you are going to break the stone basically in this procedure. So now which is the stone which is hard to break? Calcium oxalate monohydrate or dihydrate uric acid or stone? Yeah, it's a 16 stone. Uh, actually, uh, it's the calcium oxalate monohydrate among the given options. So steel is the hardest. I totally agree. But among the given options, mm -hmm. calcium oxalate monohydrate happens to be the uh, hardest one compared to the dihydrate or uric acid or stomach. Cysteine is no wonder the hardest one. But after that comes the calcium oxalate. That is monohydrate. Yeah. Okay. All are radio opaque except. So use your mnemonic here which is radiolucent. Uric acid. Uric acid. That's good. <clears throat> Candle plaques will you cause. You discussed about this. They cause urinary stone. Urinary. Right. So they're not pre malignant. Mm -hmm. okay. Somewhere people will like plaques will be the pre malignant condition, like your leukoplakia and those things. These are just to do with stones. Okay. These were some of the questions. This happened to be just anatomy class. There are not many questions on this. So further on, we'll talk about the management of renal stones. And then we'll talk about bladder and prostate and so on. Okay, we'll take that uh, in our next process, subsequent process. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Hope you like the class. Thank you for attending the class. Thank you, ma'am.